Hey, I'm Debbie. And thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you're here and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Good morning. My name is Stephen Billings. I am the children's director here at the River Church, and it is so great to be with you all this morning and opening up God's Word. And as we do so this morning, we are going to be in the book of Matthew. So if you have a Bible, I would like to encourage you to pull that out. If you do not have a Bible, please uh, grab your smartphone and get the River Church app as we have a Bible feature on there or get another Bible app. And I'm so excited as we are getting ready for Easter. I was talking with my wife and uh, my toddler's son, my wife's Annie, and uh, toddler's son is Teddy. We have an eight-month-old beau. And so I was telling Teddy about all about how we're going to be having an Easter egg hunt here and how we are going to be dropping uh, eggs out of a helicopter. And so as I'm telling my son this, I'm making hand motions like, okay, the helicopter's going to go up, buddy. And he's looking at me like, hmm. What's going on, Dad? And, uh, and I'm walking him through this, and we're going to be dropping eggs out of the helicopter. And he's looking at me like, uh, I think my dad is a royal nut job. <laughs> and now I think that I miscommunicated to him, so I'm pretty sure he's convinced that real eggs are going to come flying out of the sky on Easter. <laughs> but all this to say, I am so excited about Easter, and this morning, as we are opening up our Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 27, we are going to be focusing on some of the miracles that are taking place at the cross. And so in Matthew chapter 7, 27, we see the first uh, miracle at the cross take place in verse 45, where uh, there is darkness that is taken over all the land. Jesus is on the cross. Nails have been put through his hands and his feet, and he's experiencing the pain of the cross. And as Jesus is taking on the sin of the world, he cries out for the first time, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it is, it is as if the sun just goes out. There's complete darkness. We talked about this in our first week of the series. And as darkness has been spread out throughout all the land, Jesus cries out, and now in verse 50, where we read this morning of Matthew chapter 27, we read, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn into from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split open. So we, as we read this morning, Jesus, before he gives up his spirit, he cries out again. We know based on John chapter 9, verse 30, that Jesus yells out, It is finished, and then gives up his spirit. Spirit. And as Jesus gives up his spirit and dies on the cross, the next two miracles take place. What we talked about uh, last week is that there was a veil in the temple where the people of Israel would worship, which tears from top to bottom. And as the veil tears, it symbolizes that we now have access to the presence of God. And we have access to the presence of God through the Holy Spirit and through prayer. Our third miracle, which we're going to be focusing on today, is found at the, the end of verse 51. And it says, And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. And so we see here that an earthquake is taking place at the foot of the cross. And as I think about all the different Gospels all sharing about Jesus' crucifixion, 
what I find is so interesting is that Matthew is the only gospel writer of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, our four gospels, which include the earthquake at Jesus' crucifixion. So I begin to ask myself the question of why would Matthew be the only one to include the earthquake at the cross? I mean, this is a big deal. If right here in the middle of gathering, the ground started to shake, and we experienced an earthquake, you would all be going home, you'd be telling your friends and family about how you were at the River Church and there was an earthquake. It would be big news. You'd be pulling out your smartphone and you would be seeing news reports on social media, everyone posting about how you experienced an earthquake at gathering. It would be a big deal. Yet of our four Gospels, Matthew is the only writer who is sharing the details about what took place at the cross regarding the earthquake. And I believe this is because Matthew is keeping in mind that he's writing to a Jewish audience. Jews make up a big part of his audience that he is writing to. And so because Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, he is keeping in mind that they would have a firm foundation of knowledge in the Old Testament. So Matthew's wanting to make sure that his audience understands that not only is his writing credible, but also, but also he is wanting to show them, and this is really important, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so just as we see the earthquake at the crucifixion of Jesus, we also see the earthquake in other parts of our Bible. Um, this, this account of, of Matthew 27, of Jesus' crucifixion, this earthquake makes me think of the Old Testament earthquake that takes place at Mount Sinai. So if you would turn with me to the book of Exodus, in our Old Testament, chapter 19, we're going to see where the Ten Commandments are given. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 17 and 18. And as we turn there, part of the reason that we're going to the Old Testament is that it's not just a few times that Matthew references the Old Testament in his gospel. It's over 60 times Matthew references the Old Testament. Just to give you guys uh, a, a little sneak peek into how many times that Matthew does this, before we read in the book of Exodus, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 says, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. So we see this key word fulfilled used over and over again as Matthew's way to refer back to the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 2, verse 15 says, This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. The other term Matthew uses a lot through his gospel to refer back to the Old Testament is it is written. Matthew 4, 7 says, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so now we go to the Old Testament. We go to Exodus chapter 19, verses 16, 17, and 18, where we are at Mount Sinai. Verse 16 says, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. What we have going on here in verse 16 is, is an epic, what I see, an epic movie scene being displayed before us. We have thunder, we have lightning, we have a loud trumpet blast, which is making the people tremble. It's shaking them up. And their response to this scene that is taking place on Mount Sinai is found in verse 17. 
Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. So Moses is the spiritual leader for the nation of Israel at this time. He leads them out in front of Mount Sinai. And now this is what takes place. Verse 18, now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And so we see here that there's an earthquake taking place at Mount Sinai. God has come down from heaven to earth in fire, Smoke is veiling his glory so the people of Israel can see and they can hear God. They can experience the presence of God. And then God goes on to give the Ten Commandments to Moses. He, God is giving direction to Moses for how he wants the nation of Israel to live how he wants us to this day to live. And as God has descended on Mount Sinai here in Exodus 19, we're going to see two similarities between Exodus 19 and Matthew chapter 27. First, we see that the earth is quaking, the mountain is shaking as God's presence comes down on Mount Sinai. But as God's presence comes down, He's coming down with a goal, with a mission. And that is to tell the nation of Israel not only the Ten Commandments, but the law. In Matthew chapter 27, we have the presence of God at the cross. We have Jesus on the cross who is the Son of God being crucified. So we have God's presence in Matthew chapter 27. Jesus, the Son of God, on the cross and what is happening the earth is shaking at God's presence the ground is shaking the rocks are splitting and as Jesus is giving up his life because Jesus lived a perfect life here on earth he is fulfilling the law that was given in Exodus chapter 19 so the law is given and then in Matthew chapter 27 we see because Jesus lived a perfect life, he is fulfilling that law. So the question we then have to ask ourselves is, what is the law? And why is it so important that Jesus had to come and fulfill the law? Exodus chapter 20 gives us the details of the Ten Commandments, the first part of the law. The Ten Commandments are, you shall have no other God before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet. So God gives these Ten Commandments as the start of the law. We know that the law is also how God wanted the nation of Israel to worship himself. And, and another aspect of the law is how God wanted the nation of Israel to live for himself. And God speaks to the nation of Israel through commands and rules. And as I think about the Ten Commandments, which we are still to follow to this day, I look at my life, and I look at the Ten Commandments, and oof, there are so many times when, man, I just am disobedient. And sometimes purposely, I know I should not be doing this, but I choose to rebel against God. And as I, I read these Ten Commandments, I think, Wow, there are so many times which I've broken God's commands. In high school, uh, I 
I was really into baseball. I played lots of baseball. Um, I, I played up until college, and as I was getting ready to play in college, that's just about all I did. I would start in the spring for a spring team. I would play a, a whole spring season. Then I would go to the summer. I would do that season, and then I would go to the fall pretty much until it was snowing. And then once it started snowing, I would go start playing and practicing indoors. It's because I loved it. And baseball consumed my mind because I loved it so much. And for me, it became an idol at times in my life. And we tend to do that with things that we really enjoy. They're good things. There's nothing wrong with them. But then we tend to idolize them because we like them so much. So as I look at the Ten Commandments and I, I look at my life, I see how the law, the Ten Commandments, helps reveal how sinful I am. It does the same thing to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, they had so many more rules, so many more commands that they had to follow regarding how they had to worship God throughout the Old Testament. Uh, one act of disobedience that I think about when I, when I think about the the nation of Israel, right, Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments being given. All the way from Exodus 20 through chapters 31, we see details of the law given. Uh, Exodus chapter 32 is then the nation of Israel rebelling against God. And what the nation of Israel does is they get impatient because Moses, he's speaking to God. He receives those Ten Commandments from God. And then because Israel, it, it, they, they feel the great weight of the presence of God coming down on the mountain, Moses then just goes up by himself into a dark cloud to speak with God, to receive the rest of the law. And as Moses is speaking with God, the nation of Israel begins to rebel. They go to, to Moses' brother Aaron and ask Aaron, would you make another God for us? And Moses constructs a golden calf. And what do we see here? We see that the nation of Israel so quickly begins to worship another God. They commit idolatry. They go against the Ten Commandments. And the law shows us how sinful and broken not only the nation of Israel is, but how sinful and broken we are. Because there is no way that we can keep each and every one of the commandments that God has given us. It's not possible. We could try really hard, but we are going to fail at some point it's because we are, we are sinful, broken people. We are in need of God's grace. And so as the law shows us how sinful and broken we are, it also shows us the need for a Savior. Romans 3.23 through 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because we have sinned, because we don't measure up to the standard which is put before us, we need to be justified. And that only comes through the grace of Jesus on the cross. We need the redemption that is found in Christ Jesus. Without the grace of Jesus, we are just sinful, broken human beings. John 1.17 puts perspective for us when we think about both Exodus chapter 19 and then Matthew 27. John 1.17 shares, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. Exodus 19, we see the law being given. But because we cannot 
follow the standard of the law. We need the grace and truth of Jesus Christ our Savior. Matthew chapter 27. So if you would turn with me back to Matthew 27, we're, seeing, we're going to see the purpose of why Matthew includes the earthquake. Turn our attention back to verse 51. It says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. So as the earthquake is happening at the scene of the cross, well, what takes place next? The, ver, verse 52 and 53. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is the fourth miracle that takes place at the cross. We're going to be talking about that a little bit more next week. But if we see here in verse 53 that Matthew is referring to the resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus did not stay dead on the cross after he gave up his life. Jesus rose again, declaring victory over death, hell, and the grave. And now verse 54 is the reason why I believe that Matthew records this earthquake. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. And so we have those at the foot of the cross declaring that Jesus is the Son of God. And what is Matthew trying to do throughout his gospel? Is he wants his audience to understand that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the one who has come to fulfill the law which we cannot fulfill no matter how hard we try. Verse 54 describes how the people are declaring that Jesus is the Son of God, it says, and they were filled with awe at the scene of the cross. So they would have been experiencing that darkness. They would have been experiencing the earthquake, watching rocks split open, and coming to an understanding that, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so I want to ask you all the question today, have you declared Jesus to be the Lord of your life? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Because as Jesus was on the cross, he took all of our sin, all of our shame that comes with our sin upon him. And the reason that he could do that and fulfill the law is because he lived an absolutely perfect life. And Jesus was the only one who could do this for us. And all we have to do to accept the free gift that Jesus gives on the cross, as Romans 10, 9 says, if we declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We are saved from our sins and then have the opportunity to have eternal life with God. But we have to make the decision for ourselves to declare that Jesus is the Lord of our lives and we believe that Jesus is the Son of God who has come to earth to die for all of our failures, all of our sins. If you have made that decision to declare Jesus as the Lord of your life, I want you to ponder the scene of the cross. Just as those at the foot of the cross were in awe, we too need to be in awe of what Jesus has done for us. And my prayer for us today is that that awe would turn into thanksgiving for God sending his one and only Son 
for us who did not stay dead but reigned victorious over death for us. Would you pray with me?